Cheers. Right, as well, I've been introduced, but yeah, my name is Paul Coles. Um, and as uh, Alistair said, I'm the co-founder and creative director at Fierce Kaiju. Um, I just want to say thanks to, to Tony and the, and the team for uh, having me here at the Create Expo. Very happy to be here, and hopefully I can share some information about uh, creating uh, cool VR games. Um, I'll start by giving you a little background information about myself. Um, as a kid, uh, as some people will know, um, I uh, was massively into games, as I'm sure many of you were. Um, and I used to sort of tinker with level editors and designers, uh, stuff like that, with uh, games like Doom, uh, Duke Nukem 3D, uh, Warcraft 2, and many others. Um, that's not Doom that looks like that. It looked a bit more like this, which is um, a little more old school. Um, but from that early age, I always knew that I wanted to make video games. You know, that's something that I just you know, knew was going to happen at some point, one way or the other. Um, one thing I struggled with back then was information. And it was very difficult to, to learn um, how to do this sort of stuff when, um, you know, going back a few years. Um, so I had to sort of brute force it by just finding books and magazines or even readme.txt files that would sit in with the, the new games that we bought back then. Um, it, it was difficult. Um, uh, eventually, I got to sixth form. Um, I sort of uh, carried on just uh, trying to design levels and uh, things like that in my spare time. Um, I actually quit sixth form uh, because I went to get a job that I thought might help me get um, into the games industry. It definitely didn't, uh, so I went back to sixth form. Um, but regardless, I persisted, and it took a long time, and uh, you know, a few sort of part-time jobs here and there, and uh, I just carried on trying to learn as best I could. Um, but eventually, it paid off. Uh, sort of the first big gig that I got was um, a company called Mobius Entertainment, and there we made Game Boy Color games and Game Boy Advance games uh, for a good few years, making sort of American baseball games, which uh, was interesting when you know nothing about baseball. Um, but you know, we carried on, we made some good stuff, and eventually we were asked to do Max Payne for Rockstar. Uh, we did, um, you know, even on the Game Boy Advance, I think we had like the bullet time slow motion, which was quite a feat back then. Um, but Rockstar loved what we did with that game, and uh, they ended up buying us, and we became Rockstar Leads. Um, I was there for, I think, about nine years. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a great time, great moment in my life. We'd made some incredible games. Um, and now, if any of you ever get the chance to work at Rockstar, I suggest you do it. it you, you work very hard, but it's worth it, and uh, there's a lot of great people there. Um, working at Rockstar, you might imagine that I've worked on some pretty big titles. Uh, I'm sure some of you would have heard of them. Uh, Grand Theft Auto, I worked on Liberty City Stories and Vice City Stories, which was on the PlayStation Portable at the time. We, um, we sort of took pride in doing things that nobody else was doing. So on the PSP, we, we did sort of franchise first multiplayer. Um, so this, this was multiplayer back in, I can't remember, what was it, like 2000, oh, uh, 2000 ages ago. <laughs> and um, it, it, We had the multiplayer on, on the PSP, and, uh, and now multiplayer GTA is, is just huge, and you know, we were kind of pioneering that stuff at the time. Um, we also did Chinatown Wars on the Nintendo DS, which uh, you know, for a Ninten Nintendo platform was pretty edgy content on there. Um, and then for a short time, I helped ramp the team up for, for work on Grand Theft Auto V, uh, which I'm sure most of you have probably played. Um, in, when I worked on the GTA titles, I was mainly responsible for making sure that the mission content was up to standard. Uh, you know, it was fun to play, and, and it was what we expected of ourselves at the time. Uh, but also, I would uh, tinker with different systems in the game, such as vehicle handling, um, sort of wep weapon balancing, uh, different systems, menu systems, and things like that. Um, so a bit of a jack of all trades, really. <coughs> as well as GTA, I, I worked on Red Dead Redemption. Uh, for that, I was over in San Diego for a few months. Um, that was just a massive, massive project. Um, spanned uh, most of the Rockstar Studios at the time. Um, but it, it was an incredible title, and uh, you know, to this day, I still remain really proud of working on that game. Again, for me, it was mainly about ensuring that the, the stages and the missions uh, were at the level that we expected of ourselves and also that the gun combat and the, uh, the little mechanics that were in there, that, that they required a lot of attention to make sure that it felt good to play, and uh, yeah, that was partly my job with, with many others. After that, I worked on L.A. Noir. This, um, this was an interesting beast, because this was a little different. This was developed by a studio called Team Bondi, who were based in Australia, so the time difference was a bit of a killer. Um, but this was also published by Rockstar. It's a Rockstar game for all intents and purposes. Uh, but we were asked to help get that over the line as well. So we produced a little bit of um, sort of mission content. I was leading the team at that point. Um, 
and we had to get some, uh, what, what else did we do? We had to, the vehicle handling, I was uh, involved with that again. Um, with LA Noir, it was a little different because uh, we had to make it feel very different to Grand Theft Auto. Um, you know, the older fashion, old fashioned cars, it had to give them a bit more weight, a bit more fun sliding around the corners and stuff. Um, but it had to feel different to GTA, but still fun. And I think we managed to pull that off. Um, so after Rockstar, I decided uh, I was going to take a little time out. Um, yeah, I, I loved my time at Rockstar. It, it was, like I say, it was a great place to be. But um, I, I felt a need to push myself creatively and go in new directions. Um, like I say, we, we sort of made this habit of sort of innovating on new technology, um, like the multiplayer and, and doing a Grand Theft Auto on DS. Um, so that's always struck a chord with me. I've always wanted to sort of innovate. Um, and then the opportunity arose for me to join Activision Blizzard's uh, sort of first foray into mobile, which was called the Blast Furnace. Um, it, it was a, a, a big change for me, and, and that's what excited me. You know, it was I'd gone from building AAA uh, console titles, and uh, I was interested in the mobile space, and, and this felt like a great opportunity. Um, the first thing I did was a Pitfall game uh, with a bunch of us. It was a sort of reimagining the original Atari classic, and we had to sort of kind of stay true to that, but then update it for, for modern audiences. Um, and it, it became like an infinite runner, which was similar to Temple running games of, of that sort of ilk. After that, I uh, worked on Call of Duty Strike Team. Uh, this was a really interesting take on Call of Duty. Um, we had to make sure that the game was, the first person elements of the game were intact and uh, worked well on glass, which is, uh, you know, it's not an easy, easy feat, and uh, that, that took some doing, and we had some really un unique ideas as to how you would sort of target enemies and things like that, and you know, that, that required a lot of work. Um, but we also included this top-down strategic mode where you could flip at will between first-person mode and this third-person sort of tactical mode, um, which was quite a brave move, really, for Call of Duty. It's not really something that uh, happens easily, sort of big changes like that. Um, and it was fun, and, you know, it's worth a look. Excuse me, let me uh, quick drink. Anyway, unfortunately, after about two years, Activision decided that they were trained, uh, gonna change the strategy for mobile, and they shut the studio down. Um, so for the first time in my career, I find myself jobless, um, which was a little scary. But the thing about the Blast Furnace was there was an incredible bunch of people there, and they were supremely talented, and we felt that we wanted to try and keep some of those people together, and that's kind of where the idea for Fierce Kaiju came about. And this was, so Blast Furnace was closed, I think, early 2014, and we founded Fierce Kaiju in July of 2014. Um, and I think in this July, we'll be celebrating our four years in business, which um, is, a, is an achievement I'm proud of. Uh, it's not been easy by any stretch, so I'm going to try and sort of take you guys through uh, some of the challenges that we face. And uh, hopefully, you know, I'm sure some of you guys in here will end up doing similar things, hopefully, setting up amazing companies and doing really great creative work, and uh, hopefully you can learn a few things from us. <coughs> I'll talk about our first game, uh, Viral, and also the spin-off that we did, Viral Quarantine. Um, we were sort of among the first to uh, market in this new wave of VR. Um, and I think that this was on the Oculus and Samsung's Gear VR. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was great, but we had to upgrade that and then put it over to Oculus Rift and HTC Vive as well. So that, you know, up the graphics and um, made it a bit more shiny. Uh, but back when we did the Gear VR version, um, there wasn't a huge audience. Um, it was, you know, there was a really sort of you know, new product, so uh, getting people into it was um, was difficult. But the response that we did get from some of the press and some of the players was great, and I'll take you through some of the comments that we had on social media. So we had Frank on Twitter. Uh, he said that uh, viral light on Gear VR is badass. You know, we're quite happy about that. Then we had Ben Cochera, who's a respected journalist. He works at Polygon. Uh, so he doesn't work at Polygon. He does a lot of work with Polygon. Um, he said, do you have a Gear VR? Uh, you need viral. And then we had Polygon themselves uh, declaring that games like Viral will sell VR, which you know is, uh, we were quite happy with. Uh, I think that is actually Ben again, but you know we'll take it. Uh, then three Bens in VR. There is a pattern here. <laughs> um, do you have a Gear VR? Get Viral, one of the best full games on the hardware. Um, yeah, I think Ben was involved in that one as well. But uh, here we go. We've got a Zachary. So Zachary on Twitter: Viral for the Gear VR is the most fun thing basically ever. I've been ruined for non-VR games now. Big statement, but again, we'll take it. 
Uh, and then we had, who was this guy? This was, oh, into VR, Viral Rocks. That's short but sweet. And then, um, you know, there's a couple of things that we could take away from that. And I think the first one is clearly IO Benabir. Um, and the second one is that, uh, that three bands in VR, this was like a podcast that happened a, a couple of years back. They picked up on one of our key goals at the time. Um, and they said that it was one of the best full games on, on the hardware. Now, when we were planning viral, we noticed that at, at the time with VR, there were just some really cool demos and experiences out there, but they were just that demos and short experiences. Um, what we felt we needed to do was make a real game. Um, and so that was our focus and that was our target. We wanted to make a gamer's game. Um, and it was nice that people apparently noticed that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what things went well for us. Um, first one is frame rate. This, uh, you know, it's, I don't want to get too technical, but it's something that's important if you're developing VR games. Um, keeping a high and consistent frame rate um, is very important because if, if the frame rate dips or it drops or it's low, uh, you're going to make people feel ill, and uh, it's not nice at all. So um, hitting a decent frame rate is, is a challenge, and it certainly is on mobile devices that we were using at the time. Along with Oculus and Samsung developing the platform, uh, they were you know, bringing out new SDKs, which is a software development kit, um, and that would stomp on some of the hardware that we put in to keep the frame rate high. But you know, by and large, we kept on top of it, and it went pretty well for us. So, yeah, but that's something you should definitely keep in mind. Thirsty. <laughs> the style. So. Choosing the style wisely, uh, certainly at that point, and I think even, even now this is relevant, is, is very important because with VR, you're, you're chucking a lot at, at the computers and the graphics cards, and it needs um, some thought and some careful consideration. You know, you're not going to, it'll come, and we're getting close now, but you're not going to get sort of you know, the God of Wars or the GTA style performance or, or quality just yet. We're not a million miles away, but. Um, Choosing the style that, that best fits VR is important, and, and that is why. Um, we knew in, in the case of Viral that it was a short project, um, and it didn't have a huge budget, so we needed to make these smart choices. So we intentionally chose an aesthetic that um, was fairly simple, but it allowed us some flexibility too. Um, and we knew that we needed to make a game that would hit the quality that we'd, we sort of expected of ourselves too. So. Um, and we also needed to work very quickly. Uh, so it was, you know, there's a lot of things that we needed to consider with this. So what we sort of ended up with was we, we termed it visual interest. Um, so the game is largely made up of these large pink and purple rooms um, with interesting shapes all, all over it to sort of to give you that interest. Um, but these environments also needed to be easy for the player to understand at a quick sort of glance. Um, and the forms and the shape all became quite important in, in sort of defining that and funneling the player's sort of understanding of how that level would flow. And you know, I think that went well for us. We did some good work there. To help with that stuff, um, we worked cleverly with the lighting and the colors. Um, one example of this was um, a, the boss fight, the first boss fight you come across. You go into this sort of quite light pink room uh, as you first come in. The boss character spawns in front of you. He's bigger than anybody else you've faced so far. And as he comes in, the whole room goes this real deep, dark crimson color, and it gave a real nice sense of sort of this foreboding, sort of dangerous place to be in. Um, so that worked really well, and we were really pleased with that. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, the gameplay, we were really pleased with Viral. We, you know, I think it still stands up nicely to this day. Um, it's, you know, we focused on creating like a simple sort of simple tight game loop that's just pick up and play. You can just put it on, and immediately you understand what you're doing. Uh, you play the part of Ragnarok, who's uh, like the antivirus in this system, um, and you're protecting Eve, the supercomputer, who's under attack by these, this virus threat. Um, to do this, all you've got to do is, is look, like, look at your enemies, and you tap the side of the headset, and it fires a shot straight out in front of you, and you've just got to hit the enemies, and they ragdoll off, and you get points for that. Um, you can also charge the shot by holding it down, and it sort of fires a more sort of powerful focused shot, and that costs more ammunition, so there's a bit of resource management in there. Um, it's all relatively simple stuff, but it, it comes together nicely as a complete package. Um, but yeah, it's, it, we felt that that went really well. And the other part of the gameplay loop, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to focus on making a gamer's game. Um, so we started thinking about just the skills, again, with the charge mechanic and with the, the, the shot falling off over distance, it, it adds an element of skill into the into proceedings. So um, immediately there's quite a nice hook in there that brings the player in. And then chucking all the scores off and having leaderboards and being able to compare how well you're doing with other people is just really quite a compelling thing. It's, and it's super simple. 
So um, well worth considering if, you, if you're going down that arcade game route. Stages. So um, we had 50 stages in the game, which was both a good thing and a bad thing. So on the plus side, um, it allowed us to explore um, lots of sort of different cool ideas for, for, for VR and what would work well in VR. We had um, sort of long sort of lift elevator shafts and um, sort of thinner sort of smaller rooms and this was to play with sort of vertigo or, or to uh, see what, how like, um, you know, just narrow spaces and wider areas would work. Um, so that, that gave us the opportunity to do that. Having all these stages allowed us to have all these different elements in there. Um, obvious things came out of that, so, sort of narrow spaces did make you feel a bit more claustrophobic. Um, so we had to keep that in mind. And also with big rooms, it, it can be that they feel a bit too barren and you've got to fill that stuff up with something. So um, we had to be mindful of what we were doing with our stages while keeping them interesting, as we were saying earlier. <coughs> Other things we had to be careful with were um, just sort of going with our gut, really. Like Traversal is, is quite a tricky thing in VR. And initially we thought that like you had to look at these sort of nodes and you'd fire at them and then it'd move you through space to that point. And we felt that if we did that quickly, it was going to make people want to hurl. So we avoided that initially. And it actually turned out that it was the opposite was true. If we did that slowly, people felt ill. Uh, if you did it quick, people accepted it. Um, so we ended up with the solution that we didn't really feel would have been the right move at, at the start, but it was. Um, <coughs> so yeah, the, the other thing, kind of going on that visual interest thing, we, we had to make our stages feel exciting and interesting. So we had like a lot of fun with scale, like the, these big sort of rings around the, you know, as you're moving through them in VR, it feels really quite cool. Um, so that ties into all that visual interest I was talking about earlier. Um, sorry, excuse me. One of the other key things that we had to consider was um, in VR, like the first time you start making VR games, you've got all this room around you. And, um, you know, it's, it's easy to sort of think, well, you know, I want to do something over here and then I want to come over here. and. Um, you know, have the player walking around all this space, but in, in reality, that can be quite a tiring thing to do. Um, so you have to sort of rein it in a little bit and think about normally what a player is used to, because that still plays a part. And keeping the player's focus sort of in like a 90 degree cone in front of them seems to, to work nicely. Um, you know, don't do play with the space, but don't have them walking all over the place because they will tie it quickly and get bored. Um, and you need quick, snappy, nice gameplay beats to, to keep people engaged. <coughs> Excuse me. Knowledge. <laughs> um, VR was new then, and it's still very new now. And I, I am aware that it's a spelling mistake there. It's intentional. But, um, but the reason I wanted to talk about my career earlier on and, and give you guys a bit of that background is that almost all of that experience, not all of it, but a lot of it, is was pointless when it came to VR, which is sort of a little soul destroying. It was. We had to relearn simple things that we took for granted for many years, such as um, subtitles, how we'd show subtitles to somebody. It just wasn't the same anymore. Um, how you'd move through the environments, uh, basic things that we, uh, yeah, we had to sort of rethink and, and revisit. Um, so a lot of uh, those comfort zones that we've had for many years were just gone, and we needed to find new ways to, to present this information to people. Uh, that, that was a challenge. Um, but because we got in there early, it allowed us to get that knowledge and to um, you know, make good on that. Um, so we were pretty pleased with how that went. And uh, yeah, I'll go through some of the things that didn't go so well. <laughs> so UI, um, any VR developers that, or anybody that's even played with it will understand that UI is a tricky subject in, in VR. Um, right now, there are some solid examples out there, but when we started making viral, there just wasn't. Um, so we were kind of pioneering uh, new ways to sort of present the information to, to people. Um, yeah, with, with the benefit of hindsight, I can talk you through some specific problems that we had. Uh, but the important thing is that we did identify these problems and we, we went out of our way to fix them. So this um, was the original title screen for viral. Um, the problem with this, we had this uh, gaze selection input thing where you would uh, you'd look, the, uh, the pointer would look at one of the icons on the screen, so this little, uh, so this little thing, you'd, you'd point that at any of these icons. And then over time, a few seconds, it would charge up. Um, I was a bit stubborn with this because I felt that it was a really nice mechanic in VR, uh, that I was looking at something and it was charging up and I was selecting it. Um, and so I dug my heels in a little bit unnecessarily. When in actual fact, all people wanted to do was look at one of those icons, 
press the side of the headset and then move on. And it's, to me now, it's a simple thing, and I look back and thinking, well, why was I digging my heels in? But you know, hindsight is great. So, <laughs> but um, you know, we, you make these mistakes, but you've got to learn, you've got to try these things, and you've got to move on and iterate and, and make it better. Uh, this, this was always a tricky one with VR. So um, the targeting reticule, as you can see here in the middle of the screen, is um, just this thing here. Now, when you place um, sort of UI at depth in a 3D scene, it can cause problems in VR because um, it's, it's sort of floating there. And if it moves across a background scene and you've got an enemy sort of in front of you, as the reticule sort of moves over the enemy, your eyes sort of have this issue with depth perception. And it can really confuse the player and, and it can make people feel quite uncomfortable. So um, that was really challenging uh, for, for a good while. And I think that you know, people still struggle with that now on new games. Um, one of the solutions that we used here was as you went over an enemy, we'd pop the, the UI a little bit and give it like a little bit of an animation. And that would, the player would then accept what they were seeing as a feature and it, it worked and nobody complained about that and it was fine. But to be honest, we still weren't totally satisfied with what we'd done there. So in uh, Viral Quarantine, which was our spin-off title, we, we changed it significantly. So in fact, this is slightly wrong screenshot, but you can see that we've got this cage here that, that helps the player feel situated in VR. Um, that moves with a little bit of lag. Um, that really helps you just feel grounded in that world. Um, and in the middle here, you can see this little reticle. That's actually, because of the power up I'm using there, it's, the, it's slightly bigger than the, the standard one, which is like a laser pointer. And the laser pointer just worked much better than the previous reticle you, sh you saw, and uh, it was just better. Uh, so <laughs> we were able to go and, and fix it. Excuse me. On, uh, sorry, breaking out. Yeah, so um, I mentioned that the stages were also, you know, there, there was good things and bad things. I'll go through the bad things now. Um, the problem was the scope of our ambition. We come from this AAA background, making big, expansive games, um, and we wanted to bring that to to VR while whilst making our own game. Um, we decided, for some reason, that we were going to do 50 stages. <laughs> uh, it wasn't an arbitrary figure. We kind of went through. We got a feel for how big the stages would need to be. Um, and it felt about right at the time. But in hindsight, looking back, we could have. We know that players don't always play through to the end of a game. And that's not saying I want to shortchange the players. What they're saying is that there was no need for 50. We could have easily done 30 stages in that game, focused on the quality of those stages and not the quantity, and probably had a slightly better game. Um, but you know, that, again, benefit of hindsight, you learn these lessons and you move along. <clears throat> um, so mainly spoken about viral and what we've done with those games. And now I'm going to go through some considerations, both, I guess, for you know, running your own team uh, and VR as well. Um, just some of the stuff that we've learned transitioning from like a AAA background to, to becoming an indie team. Um, now hopefully, you know, it might be useful for some, some of you guys in future. So as I said earlier, we, we were an early bird. Um, we got fortunate in that we got a contact, and that allowed us to get a deal in place and get our first game off the ground. Um, but that one worm, as though it, you know, it was lovely, but that's not going to sustain you for very long. So you need to think about um, your next steps after the game that you're already working on. You need to have a good idea of where you're moving beyond that. Um, it sounds like an obvious thing to say to, to, to business people in the room, but when you're an indie team, you don't have a great deal of time to consider these things. You're, you're there, you're busy, you've got your head down, you're making these new games, and you've also got to think about what's going to happen in the future. So that's something that we didn't spend enough time figuring out, and we had a bit of a, a lean patch, let's say. Um, but that's something that we're much more aware of now, and you know, we plan for that. It's a lesson that we learned, and it's stung a bit, but you know, we move on. Um, but yeah, like also finding funding in VR is quite a difficult thing. Um, it's most of the publishers out there, you know, the likes of sort of EA and the, the big guys and the, some of the smaller ones even, they're a little reticent to get into VR at the minute because the market's not quite big enough. Um, there are some that are getting in there and doing some great things. You see the likes of Bethesda who have done sort of a, a Doom VR game. They've also done uh, Fallout um, and a few others. And you know, that's encouraging. And I think that this is going to change over time. So we're going to start to see more VR content more exciting from, from the big guys as well. So that's good. But um, at the minute, it's quite difficult to get funding. Um, 
your best bet right now is to go directly to platform holders, the likes of Sony uh, with PlayStation, um, the likes of Oculus and uh, HTC. Um, these guys are actively looking for, for new games. Um, however, uh, most of the people that have been developing VR games over the last few years are, are keenly aware of this. So the content and the quality of those demos that people are pitching are just really high at the minute. And you've got to you know, knock it out of the park to, to impress those people. <coughs> So yeah, the, the pitch. This is uh, something that's it's a, it's a very challenging thing to get the pitch right. Um, and this is when you're just going and talking to these people and trying to get them interested in whatever it is that you're building. Um, as you start pitching to people and, and getting your ideas to people, you might hear of uh, deals getting signed on the back of napkins or for one sheet concept. Um, and whilst I'm sure that that has happened, it's unlikely. Um, you know, it's, it's probably more down to the relationship that those people have in place more than their content. And, um, what I'm saying is that the quality of your pitch is, is the most important thing here. You need to ensure that um, you know, you're selling your team, your abilities, and um, you know, what your concept is. And you need to do a very good job of selling that. It's got to be concise, it's got to be to the point, and it's got to really get people excited. Um, another thing to consider is that if you're, certainly if you're pitching video games, um, a demo of the game is worth a 1,000 PowerPoint presentations. You, know, you can go with a PowerPoint presentation. You might get lucky. You might get signed. I say lucky. It could be just such an awesome idea. But um, a demo will uh, you know, almost always be required these days. And just to go back on that point, actually, the, um, we've even found this. Even though we have you know, um, great experience, um, initially, when VR first started, People were willing to listen to just ideas because it was so early. But now, um, even for us, like a, a demo of our concept is, is just required. Um, so if, you, if you're going to start pitching stuff to people, make sure that you're working on a great demo. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one thing to consider as well um, is that VR should be considered a new platform in a similar way to, to mobile when that first kicked off. Um, you know, it must be, you know, when the, I guess when Apple really kicked off with the iPhone. Excuse me. You can sort of make a correlation between sort of VR developers now and mobile developers back then. Um, what was happening a lot back in the mobile space is that people were bringing across sort of existing IP onto mobile um, and sort of expecting that that would be enough, uh, when in fact, uh, in many of those cases, those games just weren't very good on mobile. You know, the first person shooters, and even some of the work that I've done in the past, I would sort of say, maybe don't do it like this. Um, you know, it's, it's exciting to see these big games on mobile, and it's exciting to see these games in VR, but you really need to focus on the platform that you're targeting and the features of that platform. Why should that game be on that platform? What are you doing with it that makes it work, that makes it compelling, makes people want to play it? Um, so, sorry, I'm losing my track here. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's, that's kind of covered that one. It's just being, being mindful of, of the target platform, making sure that your, your stuff sings. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the social aspect of VR, this is quite an important one. Um, people sort of misunderstand VR a little bit and assume that it's um, sort of an insular experience that you, you're kind of just on your own. And you know, I can see why people have that misconception, but it's not entirely true. Um, you look at games such as um, Keep Talking Nobody Explodes, and this is where one person's in VR, they can see this bomb, and people around the room have got a piece of paper and they can read. Uh, so the pl player with the bomb, with the VR headset on, is explaining what they're seeing. The people outside have got pieces of paper, and they're giving them advice based on what they've seen. And that sort of stuff is really compelling in VR, and it's, uh, it's, it's really fun to play with friends and family. So, uh, and I know platform holders are really interested in, in those kind of ideas. Oh, thank you. Cheers. <clears throat> so respite, this is quite an important one for VR games. Um, you've got to think about... <sighs> Playing games in VR is quite tiring compared to traditional gaming. Um, and so with us with Viral, we were mindful of how long our, our stages were going to be. Some of the stages were sort of 30, 40 seconds long in, you know, if you were good at the game. Um, but generally, we aimed for sort of two to three minutes per stage. And between that, the player could have a menu system where they could get back out of the game, get back into the menu system, and get out of VR uh, really quickly. Um, it's not so important for people that have been playing VR games for a while, as I'm sure some of you may have done. But, um, when p new people are coming to, to, to VR, it's quite important that they can um, just make sure that that's accessible for those people, that they can get out of it quickly if they need to. Um, I think one of my friends at Sony used to call it a, 
sort of hard eject, which is where basically they get the headset and just throw it off because they're, they're not happy with what they're seeing in front of them. Um, so you've just got to be mindful of the player and what they're seeing. Uh, when testing uh, VR tiles, this is something we definitely didn't do enough of with the original viral. Um, get as many people as possible to play your game. Now, this is true for traditional games too. Um, you just have so many people playing it, especially people that you know, are not familiar with uh, your game type or even the platform. So um, like VR virgins, if you like, are you know, they're, they're like gold dust. Like they're just, you, know, you need them because you have them and they can tell you what makes them feel uncomfortable, why your game's not working for them. And you can pick up on these early and then change uh, to make sure that you know, you're, you're making the game as, as good as it can possibly be. Um, but yeah, just get lots of people playing, keep lots of data, and just you know, making sure that you're refining and, and sort of making the game the best it, it, it can be. Labeling, this is quite an important thing. It's quite a boring thing, but it's also quite, um, quite important for VR specifically. You, um, you have to ensure that the people that are coming to VR know what they're getting themselves in for. It's no good having, say, a roller coaster experience that's themed, I don't know, like a unicorn princess party or something, and you, which would probably be quite cool, but you know, they, 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 um, a player that might come and see that theme and go, you know, that's something I'm really into, then gets in the game and all of a sudden they're on a roller coaster and it's hurtling down the track and th they might even hate roller coasters and uh, you could really put people off by not ensuring that people know what they get themselves in for. So it's really important for VR. Um, you know, the marketing materials that you put out there, uh, you know, the sort of images that you put out have got to sort of get across what the point of your game is. Um, I guess I want to just say that, you know, take all that I've been saying to you guys with a pinch of salt, sort of it's, see it as a loose guide. I sort of have always firmly believed that um, you know everything should be challenged and iterated upon. Um, you know, as much as I believe this, the information I've given you today, it's um, you know it, it it can improve, it can get better. We can we're, we're constantly improving ourselves and we're constantly getting better at making these games. So you know, move forwards with a bit of confidence and conviction, um, but don't be scared of being wrong, and certainly don't be scared of asking questions. Um, you know, that's how we learn. And I think you know you've just got to play and have some fun, and that will shine through in the work that you're doing. Um, I think I'm getting towards the back end of my talk now, but I'd, I'd like to finish on two important points um, that you know, we, we're thinking about a lot at the minute. Um, historically, the games industry has uh, been dominated by middle-aged white males. Um, that's, you know, it's, not, uh, it's understandable when you look into the history of games, um, and I'm absolutely aware that I'm such a person. But my experience over the years, and certainly over the world, has taught me that People from different backgrounds and with different perspectives bring so much to the table. Um, and you know, if you're a couple of guys sat there making a cool project in Unreal and Unity, and uh, you know a, a girl that's doing some amazing 2D artwork, get her involved. Get her sort of making you, uh, helping you refine the vibe and the vision of your game and making it look beautiful. And you know, maybe <laughs> you, you know you know a girl that loves uh, streaming content on on Twitch or YouTube. You know, give her an early copy of your game. Let her get some access to the game and sort of really you know, sort of assist people and help them assist you in pushing what you're doing out there. Um, you know, maybe you're even in a sort of same-sex relationship and your partner's just an incredible writer. Get, that, get your partner involved too. You know, sort of really get them sort of getting into what you're into and writing some great stuff together. You know, diversity is, is so important and it's in our industry, we need to do better at it. And that's something that I'm hoping is gonna come through over the years. Um, I think just generally, you know, think about inclusivity and, and just being progressive and, and sort of, you know, be a stand-up person. <coughs> uh, sort of lastly, really, just aim to inspire people. Um, you know, take inspiration, but create new, new experiences, cool new things. Um, you know, you might end up in a position, um, much like my partner and, uh, has ended up where she's now teaching hell, uh, hour of code at school, which um, to, to a bunch of kids that have never touched code before. And, you know, seeing her come home and seeing my daughter come home and talk about that stuff is just incredibly sort of inspiring stuff. Um, ultimately, I think we need much better ideas and what scope you can stick on an assault rifle or what new dance modes you can unlock in your game. You know, and I, I want to see it progress and hopefully that's where you people in this room can come in and, and help create much more exciting content. Uh, that's pretty much it from me. So. Just want to say thanks to all of you for listening. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, and you can follow Fierce Kaiju on Twitter too. So, thank you very much.
Uh, yeah, sorry, do you, uh, any questions for anybody? General pipeline, uh, Unity. <laughs> so, I wouldn't say it's better, it's different. Um, yeah, we, we use both. Uh, primarily we use Unity just for fast prototyping. Um, you know, Unreal's certainly got some things it does better than Unity, and I, I would say the true is true of Unity these days. Um, you know, it's, it's just what you know and what you're comfortable with. So one thing I would always suggest is, uh, and I'm, you might well be aware of, but just don't ever get hung up on what's better than what. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a tool. And if you can make a great game in Game Maker or whatever it might be, make a great game in Game Maker. You know, um, Unity and Unreal, both great things. You know, just, just work with what you're, you're comfortable with, I would say. Yeah, yeah, same here. So. Yeah, I, I get that, yeah. The, sorry, Unity is? Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, you know, I think that um, with Unity, you probably need somebody that's a bit more tech savvy, a bit more code savvy. Um, and Unreal is probably a little easier to, to get going. But there's a lot of tutorials out there now, and there's a lot of ways to... Uh, you know, uh, Unity are improving all the time um, in that regard as well. So recently, they've added things like Pro Builder, which really allows you to sort of put um, white box stages together super quickly, and you can chuck in a first or third person controller and have something running around really quickly. Um, so yeah, I mean, largely for us, you know, we've done the whole... Uh, bespoke engines back in our AAA days. It's something we don't want to go anywhere near when there's just the four of us. So, um, uh, yeah, Unity and Unreal or any of those you know, engines that are there fully formed, uh, I would say if you're an indie team, get involved um, you know, with any of them. And, uh, yeah, YouTube's your friend. Get, get that information from YouTube. Um, does that help? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's my take on it. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of Unity, I'll say that much. <laughs> Any more? Yep. So, um, in short, we didn't. <laughs> we um, we kind of made the game, uh, certainly in the case of Viral, so simple that, that we didn't even use subtitles. Um, we had a VO in there, uh, which I know is technically not ideal, certainly for disabilities and stuff. Um, but at that point, because of the, uh, you know, the the lower. You know, the smaller market, uh, it, it wasn't so much of a risk for us. Uh, what we tend to try and think about now is um, bringing the subtitles into the world more. So uh, presenting that information maybe on screens within the game or somewhere within the game that might make sense. Um, but it's a challenge still for sure. You know, there are ways of doing it and just having, like, like say, like a raycast out and just doing it from this distance or from the camera or whatever. Um, and I, I, you know, you just got to play with it, I would say, and, and find the right solution for your game. Um, but yeah, it's a challenge. What, what are you doing? At the minute with it. Um. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, no, I, I, I understand. Yeah, I think. Um, Again, just to take that example, like if you're on a roller coaster, um, having the text sort of floating, um, it might be best if it's floating off the front of the roller coaster or something like that, where the player knows they can look back and see that the text is there, rather than it being linked to the camera. Um, that that might work. Um, but yeah, it's it, it, con context is important. You know, it, it could be different if you're if you're in a first-person game, if you're in a third-person game. The way you're presenting that text is this is what I was saying. It's like we're all learning how to do this in a better way for VR. Does that help? A yeah. Any more? No? Cool. Think we're good. Thanks, Paul.